Good afternoon, and welcome to AEI's virtual event, Neurodiversity and the Future of Work. My name is Brent Orell. I'm a senior fellow at AEI, where I specialize in workforce development policy. AEI is a nonprofit public policy think tank dedicated to defending human dignity, expanding human potential, and build a free, building a freer and safer world. The work of our scholars and staff advances ideas rooted in our belief in democracy, free enterprise, American strength and global leadership, solidarity with those at the periphery of our society, and a pluralistic entrepreneurial culture. Every year, 50,000 American children on the autism spectrum reach their 18th birthday. About 80% of those young adults will be and currently are unemployed. Neurodivergent individuals include those on the autism spectrum disorder, uh, autism disorder spectrum, sorry, uh, and those with bipolar uh, disorder, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and several other intellectual and developmental differences. Neurodivergent individuals face unique challenges in the labor market. Uh, issues which are only growing more complex with the rise of remote work, automation, and the growing importance of non-cognitive or soft skills. Today, AEI welcomes NeuroTalent Works, a nonprofit organization seeking to transform the lives of adults on the autism spectrum by providing opportunities for meaningful and gainful employment. I've asked Jessica Lee of NeuroTalent Works to offer remarks on the state of neurodiversity in employment. I will provide an overview of some of the general labor market conditions and federal programs that seek to promote employment among neurodivergent individuals. And then we'll be turning to our panelists, whom I will introduce in a few moments, to discuss policies and practices in the space of neurodivergent employment as well as the experiences of neurodivergent workers themselves. We plan to have time at the end of the event for questions from the audience. If you'd like to submit a question, we're going to put up a banner shortly with the email and the Twitter hashtag for you to do. First speaker today is Jessica Lee who is the executive director and co-founder of NeuroTalent Works. She is, a, she is passionate about being a catalyst for positive change and driving a human-centered approach. NeuroTalent Works partners with companies to embrace neurodiversity and neurodivergent workers. Jessica, please uh, kick us off. Uh, with your introduction of some of the policy and practice um, questions we're going to be uh, addressing today. Thank you, Brent. Um, thank you so much for having us and all of the panelists that are here today to have this important discussion together. Um, I think we have slides that are coming up that we'll speak to. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So just to give you know greater context to neurodiversity and the future of work, um, if you could go to the next slide, we want to just start with an introduction of you know what is neurodiversity. Um, as Brent mentioned, neurodiversity is embracing a diversity of minds in the workplace, in our societies, and recognizing that differences in how our brains are developed and differences in brain functioning are normal, um, that cognitive diversity is a normal part of our society and in our human development. Um, as mentioned before already, this includes autism, dyslexia, ADHD, and other developmental differences that impact ways of thinking, learning, socializing, and communicating. On the next slide, um, it, within neurodiversity, um, autism and those on the autism spectrum um, encompass you know, the largest group within those that are neurodivergent. And in the United States currently, one in 54 children are diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And this is a growing prevalence. Um, and you know, every year, 
autistic adults reach 18 years old and are entering the workforce um, in the 50,000. And I've heard that this number has grown. And as we look at how prevalence is increasing, um, this could be due to more sophisticated medical tools of diagnoses or even just diagnoses happening at younger ages, we know that this a growing adult population is ever increasing. Um, for those on the spectrum, 80% are currently unemployed in the United States. And this is a statistic that came from before the pandemic. So we can only imagine what this employment rate looks like today. But we really have to sit with this 80% um, and, and really let that sink in. And that's why we're having this conversation today. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about neurodiversity in the workplace, you know, setting context for this from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint, where a lot of DEI efforts and companies in particular have really focused on what we would say are identity diversities, those that are more apparent, such as gender and race, um, where cognitive diversity is less apparent. And when we take strategies for inclusion for cognitive diversity and neurodiversity, it requires us to approach work differently. Um, now, some of the additional complexity to this is also recognizing the unique strengths of neurodiversity. With developmental differences in our brain, um, what's amazing is that it also lends to these really unique strengths. Um, in the autism community, there's a very important quote that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So we cannot draw a broad stroke that everybody on the autism spectrum or everyone that's neurodivergent has these unique gifts. But there are some very unique strengths that come from developmental differences, such as uh, you know, ability to focus for longer periods of time, recognition of data patterns in a completely different way. We'll talk about this later. Um, but just starting to put context to this as well, that there are these very unique gifts. Um, now, in order to be inclusive, given that it is cognitive diversity, something that's less apparent, we believe that the greatest barrier is the interview process, where a traditional interview relies on your verbal communication skills in order to sell yourself that you are the best employee to be hired. Our organization and many like ours are working with companies to consider how to build a more equitable hiring process, where candidates not only have you know a communication a verbal communication interview traditional but also how do we find ways to have technical interviews that allow candidates to actually showcase and demonstrate their skills for the job and this is where the most aha moments come from our managers that we work with and we'll talk about this a bit later next slide please um, so when we talk about neurodiversity in the workplace the complexity here is that, you know, we're not just wanting to talk about how do we help, uh, you know, hiring initiatives that um, increase the number of representation of our community, but also how do you build workplaces where there's job sustainment and growth for our community? And we believe the foundation to that is psychological safety, that all feel welcome and that they belong in a workplace. Um, and many of the strategies that we take for neurodiversity are actually best for everybody. And that is really the fundamental um, understanding and, and principles of universal design. And what I'm adding here is human-centered design, um, where you know, the voice of the community should really be amplified to how we talk about this work, how we build inclusive strategies in the workplace, um, and universal design, really thinking about the very different learning styles that we all have. A lot of classrooms in the United States embrace universal design, recognizing that students learn in different ways and providing different formats of learning. It's those same principles that we need to be bringing to the workplace to ultimately make it accessible for everybody. Um, and so this is just to provide some greater context as we dive deeply into this topic. Okay, thank you so much, <clears throat> Jessica, for just giving us the big picture here on what we mean when we talk about neurodiversity and neurodivergence. Um, my piece of this introduction now is really to focus on the why. Why do we need to be concerned about this? Uh, and there are a number of different reasons, uh, and I want to focus on 
the nature of the economy. I don't think it's any um, any secret uh, that uh, the recovery from the pandemic is not going as anticipated um, for a variety of reasons uh having to do with from for everything from a very high rate of quits and and uh people switching jobs to early retirements uh to ongoing fear of the covid virus we have a lot more jobs open right now than we have people to fill them uh, about 10.4 million open jobs 8 million available workers uh, if we could magically match the 8 million to the 10.4 uh, and just give everybody uh, that all of those 8 million a job, we'd still be a couple million people short. Um, that is a, um, a relatively new problem. The labor market hasn't been this tight in a long time. However, um, it's not a problem that's necessarily going away. We have a demographic squeeze going on um, called a, one uh, analyst has called this a sans-demic, literally a without people problem uh, because of lower birth rates. Uh, and into the future, uh, that's going to pressure the labor market just to keep enough people uh, to fill the jobs um, uh, and keep the economy running is going to be a real challenge. So we don't, the point of all of that is that we don't have any people to waste. We never have any people to waste, but we especially don't have people to waste when it comes to the future of the economy. It's really an all hands on deck um, uh, situation. We need, uh, we need everybody uh, and we need to figure out how to use them to their highest and best um, contributions to the economy. And that includes uh, the neurodivergent. Um, th these are human beings. They have intrinsic innate dignity that we need to honor. Uh, uh, and we need them um, as part of a, a national community um, that is uh, dependent upon the labor of individuals. Um, work has intrinsic value to workers uh, and it provides meaning and purpose another huge reason for this this is a way for people to contribute all of us uh, who work have that sense of contribution um, to the broader society and we want that sense of contribution for all of our citizens including uh, the neurodivergent you can go to the next slide so um, depending on how we define neurodivergence, somewhere between 10 and 30% of the population has a neurodivergent trait. Um, and I, I wanna emphasize on this point that there are none of us who do not have some sort of a limitation as it relates to work. We all have things that we do better and worse uh, some people are words people and some people are math people. Uh, some people have um, are great with their hands. Some people are uh, better at a keyboard. Uh, it, uh, all of us have um, strengths and weaknesses. And it's important to bear that in mind that for every weakness that we might see in a, in a neurodivergent person, there's a corresponding great strength that goes along with that. Uh, and it's we would need to focus on strengths when we're talking about all workers, um, and that includes um, neurodivergent workers. In the case of autism, about 44% pursue some sort of post-secondary education to prepare for employment. We know that's incredibly important uh, to get people with those credentials into the workforce. Uh, if, we're, if a person with autism uh, pursues a post-secondary certification or degree, that's an incredibly valuable thing to the economy. We need to not let it go to waste. Um, we also, you can also see here on these pie charts, we've got students with language or speech impairments uh, and their rates of uh, enrollment in college, uh, learning disabilities, and as I said, uh, individuals with autism. And go to the next slide. 
Okay, so the federal government is not silent uh, about much of anything, uh, but it is not silent certainly on the topic of fostering uh, at open workplaces for all Americans, including those um, who uh, may uh, have neurodivergent qualities. Um, Section 503, uh, requires that 7% uh, that government contractors and subcontractors have at least 7% of their um, workforce uh, as individuals with uh, cognitive disabilities. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, which prohibits discrimination against persons with disabilities, including the neurodivergent uh, at, within the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA, which is the main uh, workforce development funding vehicle statute. Um, we have something called the National Disability Institute that really focuses on these policy issues. And then finally, we have the Ticket to Work program at the Social Security Administration, which is designed to help individuals with all kinds of disabilities uh, to gain access to the resources that they need to secure training and employment um, without putting their um, public benefits at risk. You can go ahead and advance the slide. So now I wanna just briefly introduce our panelists um, today. Uh, first, we have Alex Generous, uh, who is a neurodiversity activist speaker and behavior consultant. Um, her TED talk, which I recommend to everybody, uh, her TED talk called My Inner Life has received over 2 million views and she's spoken around the world on her life experiences. She travels internationally for her, her consulting business, educating people on autism, neurodiversity, and raising awareness on the importance of ethical mental health care. Our second speaker is Scott Michael Robertson. He's a senior policy advisor at the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, I know that when I was at the U.S. Department of Labor, um, ODEP was a key and treasured partner uh, in advancing uh, workforce opportunities um, for all sorts of populations um, uh, that um, that have limitations in their ability to access employment. So it's great to have Scott with us today to give us that federal perspective. And then finally, Jose Velasco uh, is a business pro process intelligence program director at SAP and an autism at work ambassador. And he's done tremendous on the ground work um, in actually fostering and developing job opportunities for individuals uh, who uh, who are neurodivergent, and he can tell us what this looks like from the business um, perspective. So um, <clears throat> we're going to um, jump right into a few structured questions uh, that I'm going to be directing to the panelists, um, and uh, we'll start with Jose. Um, and his work with SAP. Is it SAP, Jose, or do you call it SAP? Uh, SAP. SAP, yeah, Correct. I like that better too. <laughs> um, uh, to open this conversation, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the definition of talent and how society and employers might begin to redefine talent to be more inclusive of neurodivergent populations. Thank you, Brent. Thank you for having me and, and the opportunity to, to share some of these experiences with our community. Uh, I think that for us to talk about uh, talent, we need to define what talent means. And in very, very broad strokes, we can say that talent is a creative, artistic, athletic or other aptitude that when applied uh, results in a valuable outcome. And what I think that what we're talking about here is the key issue of finding talent and ways to find and identify that, that talent. Um, we as enterprises are really, really good at understanding those who possess a talent. 
and who have the ability to articulate that talent. Okay. And that is something that is, I mean, a no brainer, you know, somebody has a talent, they come and tell you about it. They express it. There's no issue. We're also really good at understanding those who can articulate a certain ability um, even when they don't, they don't have it, okay? And that is also something that we, are, we have the ability to do. But what happens with those who have the talent and do not have a really good ability to articulate that in a traditional way? And I believe this is where companies have a very, very significant blind spot. I believe that that blind spot really leads into, into concepts or terms like the war for talent, where companies are competing for a finite resource that looks and feels exactly the same way. And as with anything else, when you have competition like that and it's concentrated on a certain resource, in this case, human resource, it increases the cost and the ability to ac acquire talent in the organization. But if we open our perspectives a little bit, if we have these blinders okay that are like this and we open them a little bit and we move away from looking at only one type of talent and we redefine our perspective we're going to find people here in the periphery that are outside on the edges that are those folks that you were mentioning earlier brent that are people that are the unemployed who have the talent who might not be able to articulate exactly how to position themselves but that do have the talent and I believe also that in that area, you're going to find people. And as we say, innovation comes from the edges, from the people that look and perceive the world in a different way. It, and this is really a great opportunity for us as organizations to not only redefine talent, but redefine the ways in which we capture that talent in our organizations. There's a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure if it's only me, but if you can put yourself in mute, the other speakers, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> Um, again, I think that there is, this is a, a matter of redefining uh, talent, but also the processes that we use to identify the talent. We offer today almost the same intake experience for every different type of talent that is out there. And, and if we look at the way that companies work, we have a multi-channel experience for uh, products that we launch and produce and, and make available to our customers. And the reason why we do, do that is because we have different segments of consumers. I believe that we need to adopt the same principles on the inbound side when it, as it re refers to talent. Having a multi-channel experience for people that, um, again, look and, and feel and experience things in a different way. Only in that way, in my opinion, we will be able to, to be able to capture the, those people that I was saying earlier uh, are on the edges. So uh, that's a really good place to bring in Alex and, and Scott uh, into this conversation. Um, both of you work in this area of trying to foster uh, both policy and practice um, uh, that helps to open up um, uh, the workplace uh, for people with uh, neurodivergent backgrounds. Um, a, a number of, I, I think Jessica mentioned this, and I, it comes up frequently in this conversation uh, of um, human centered or universal design. Uh, of um, uh, workplaces and policies and practices. I wonder if you could uh, briefly explain what that means uh, for people who may not be, uh, you know, uh, conversant uh, necessarily in some of the business management um, lexicon that we're dealing with. Alex, why don't you, you're, you're out there on the front line. Why don't you talk about this a little bit? Sure thing, Brent. Great question. Um, going into this idea of universal design, it's um, so basically what a universal design is, is a design or composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood and used by the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of age, size, ability. Um, and an environment should be designed to meet the needs of all the people who wish to work in it. And this is not a special requirement for the benefit of only a minority of a population. It is a fundamental condition of a good design. If the environment is 
accessible, usable, convenient, and um, easy to use, everybody benefits. And by considering the diverse needs and abilities of all throughout the design process, universal design creates environments and workplaces that meets all people's needs. Simply put, it's a good design. We've gotten used to this idea of universal design as it relates to physical um, disability, you know, that uh, when you install a ramp, it isn't just people who need a ramp who use that ramp it can, or who are in a wheelchair. It can be a lot of other people. Um, what's an example of a universal design um, issue that um, that is specific to accommodating uh, and encouraging the inclusion of neurodivergent workers, but then also has the kind of benefit that you're talking about for uh, neurotypical workers? I'm happy to answer this as well, and I can give an example. Uh, for example, let's say you live and work in a place that doesn't have um, a water fountain. Simply by putting in a water fountain, you are improving the health of everybody that you work with. So that is not specific for a person um, who's neurodivergent, but at the same time, it still meets the needs of everyone and makes it a better environment to work with. And that, as a result, benefits everybody. And that's the sort of um, process that we're hoping to push forward. Scott, would you like to weigh in on this? Um, what does it look like from the federal um, perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, and um, first, I wanted to mention, too, that uh, big supporter of universal design. Uh, we have a universal design topic webpage on ODEP's website at dol.gov slash agency slash ODEP. And um, I would say it very much aligns with how the private sector sees it as making sure there's access for everybody with and without disabilities to support full engagement in life, workplace, uh, community, uh, equitable use, flexibility of use, simplicity, um, having principles so, so you don't have to have un unnecessary physical effort. I mean, there's a lot of common principles for universal design that benefit engagement by all folks. And one example that I often mention, for instance, here in the workplace is like direct feedback, positive encouragement from supervisors, for instance. Everybody would love that, right? Um, I, I think we'll be talking about later on, but I think that most things that help empower neurodivergent folks and other people with disabilities in the workplace are universal design approaches. And I think a lot of what we've been learning from autism-focused supports, neurodiversity-focused supports over the last 5, 10, 15 years applies to the whole country and the whole world, actually, and can really benefit performance and productivity um, and how folks can apply their talents and skills to drive success and full inclusion in the workplace. And you've seen that in the history too, with like technology, for instance, that you talk about audio books, speech recognition, all of that came from often from supporting people with disabilities. And it became universally designed in terms of integration of that technology into society. And you can think of that with other practices that people have in terms of when they're adjusting lighting or sound, you know, lighting, sounds, removing uncomfortable scents. Benefits neurodivergent folks, benefits other folks who may have find that harsh lighting, uh, loud noises, for instance, can be distracting for folks. Mm -hmm. And again, it's all about talents and skills for performance and productivity. That that a lot of the changes to apply for universal design are in line with the business mission, the, the business bottom line, or the agency mission for us here in the federal government or in state and local government to improve productivity and performance um, and achieve, you know, in in terms of businesses, you know, gaining better cost, having better value for their products and services here in the government for serving our stakeholders across the country. The American people are our uh, stakeholders and, you know, talents and skills that can, that can drive that. As my boss often says, it's, this is not a charity mission. This is, you're not doing this because you're going to go to heaven or you shouldn't be. You should be doing this because the talents and skills of neurodivergent folks benefit um, the workplace and universal design can help that make that happen not only for neurodivergent folks, but I would say just workplaces overall uh, for folks with and without disabilities to improve again inclusion in the workplace. Uh, 
Thanks, Scott. It, that, it's really helpful um, to sort of have that framing. Um, I, I, I think it's great that people want want to get to heaven, uh, but I would really like them to, in the meantime, try to do some good uh, here on earth. Um, so, uh, Jose, would you like to just talk a little bit about uh from the you know from the industry side what does this look like you know what what kinds of um steps does has sap taken uh to adopt universal design principles absolutely i i think that we are in a journey i think that this is something that we continue to discover and uh create and refine over over a period of time and the example or examples that I will share with you are ideas in some case partially implemented and in some cases fully implemented. But let me give you an, an example that I believe everybody would appreciate. Uh, for those in the audience who don't know about the SAP Autism at Work program, is a, a program that is dedicated to identify talent on the autism spectrum and, and hire them and support them here, here at SAP. The program is implemented in 16 countries and we have uh, in excess of 30 different types of roles, ranging from uh, software developers to mathematicians to business analysts to people in human resources, all over the organization. Every division of the company is represented already by somebody who is on the autism spectrum. Part of the process that we have created for identifying talent, sourcing, screening, and onboarding talent on the autism spectrum includes, as Jessica was saying, one of the hardest things that there is out there, which is the interview process, where we lose a lot of great talent companies, not only SAP, but many companies, because of the methods that we utilize to try to engage in learning what that talent is bringing to the table. So what we have adopted in some locations is providing during the interview or before the interview process, questions or topics ahead of time those reduce the anxiety of people the conversation goes in a completely different way why because the person comes in with the research already in hand they are able to express how they got to that answer what resources they use i don't know about you guys but the last time that i went into a meeting and i had a panel of people asking me questions <laughs> was was a long long time ago okay in companies, we work in a much more articulated way in which we're invited to a meeting. Somebody has the courtesy of providers with pre-read materials, perhaps, or at least the topics that we're going to be addressing. And you know who the participants are. If we are able to provide this experience for autistic people to reduce their level of anxiety and as such, being able for them to express in a more natural way their, their talents and abilities, the question is, is this type of method something that everybody would benefit from? And I can tell you one thing, if they would have offered it to me when I signed up with SAP or any of the companies in the past, I would have raised my hand and said, yes, thank you. I would really appreciate a more structured interview. Who's going to be coming in and out? What types of breaks do I get? And the topics that we will be discussing. So the conversation moves away from how many bubble gum you can put in a swimming pool, okay, as one of the questions to one that is a little bit more certain a little bit more professional and a little bit more accommodating for everybody. That is a really terrific example. And I, I was just last night, I was like, how many jobs have I had in my life and my career so far? And it's a lot, you know, and my wife will tell you it's too many um, uh, jobs that I've had. And uh, I would have loved a, an interview opportunity in which I was uh, sort of given the question, some of the questions at least ahead of time, so that I could think, you know, and really give a more reflective answer. So it's an ex interesting example of a practice that um, would be useful for all kinds of workers, uh, potentially, instead of having a, you know, a game of gotcha in the interview, which is really trying to see how fast you are on your feet, you know, exactly. that doesn't really give you uh, a whole lot of information. Uh, about a candidate. Exactly. Jessica, is there anything else that you wanted to add on this um, on this topic? Yeah, thank you. I think I would add a couple of things. Jose, I think you alluded to this where, you know, the scenario in which even in the workplace in general, where you would be in a situation like an interview that you don't have any, you don't know what to prepare for, that you're just being asked questions and asked to think on your feet to come up with an answer that that rarely happens. And that may happen, you know, as you move up in an organization more towards management roles, 
at which point you're being coached and you have mentors in the organization that are teaching and showing you the way. So when we think about an interview, you know, why are we putting our candidates in a situation for them to not perform well when we're really trying to find the best and the top talent that we need to do this particular job? Um, and that's where, you know, redesigning the interview process, I think, is so important for neurodivergent candidates where, you know, relying on verbal communication for me to sell why I'm the best person for the job is not good for any company. And I, you know, a lot of the managers that we talk to, there everybody has had an employee that interviewed so well, but when they got down to actually performing the work, it was a very different scenario. Um, and so the universal design to the interview process for neurodiversity at work programs looks at how do we actually gauge the skills for the job? You know, IT, uh, I think techn highly technical roles, that's already very much a part of how we interview and find candidates to actually showcase their skills for the job, to do a coding test, to do an Excel test. Um, and the managers that we work with, that's where I think the transformation really happens when they come into an interview and we start with the skills-based assessment, showcasing the skills for the job, and then going into, okay, can you debrief? Can you tell us what you were thinking when you approached this problem? And you may notice that the communication style of our community is a little different, that there might be you know, a communication style that is more monotone, or where there's just longer pauses for information processing to provide an answer or very direct answers. That's more, you know, exactly answering the question that you're being asked. But the managers tell us that, you know, they can look past those verbal differences because they see the skill sets that our talent brings. And that's what anybody of any of us want. Um, and all of the unconscious bias training that companies do for every type of diversity dimension is all about removing that unconscious bias. So when we look at our neurodivergent community, this is the way in which we do it, where we do not put so much emphasis on verbal communication styles for whether you're a good employee and a good hire for a company. It's terrific. Um, we could go on for a long time on this topic, uh, and I, I hope we have a moment, maybe we can load this into the Q&A, but I really would like to hear from Alex and Scott about their personal experiences um, uh, uh, in the workforce and sort of, you know, how these challenges manifest and then how you have um, been able to move past them. So we'll, we'll handle that as part of the, uh, uh, the first, I'll, I'll exercise the uh, prerogative of the chair. I will ask the first question and that will be the first question um, when we get to Q&A. So we're going to move on to the next section of this um of this panel discussion which is really about the future of the neurodiverse uh the future of neurodiverse work um and i want to uh i want to start out again with jose uh on uh on this topic um what <clears throat> pardon me what do you think are the biggest challenges over the next five to ten years um uh, regarding work for the neurodivergent um and are we at, a, do you think we're at a turning point or, or maybe we haven't reached that inflection yet? I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, I think that we are at a point right now, Brent, in which we have proven that the establishment of this type of programs is a very viable in, in, in realistic uh, program in organizations, uh, whether they are the private, public sector, NGOs, et cetera. Uh, there are, that I know of, approximately 40 companies that are part right now of what is called a round table. A round table is an, a, a, an apparatus that was put in place by Disability In, one, an, uh, an NGO that a lot of, of you are familiar with. And these are companies who have implemented autism hiring programs, in this case, uh, uh, more broadly speaking, neurodiversity programs. Uh, what I have observed over the last few years is that everybody has implemented a slightly different version 
company A from company B, but the guiding principles of these programs are the same. We need to provide supports in sourcing, in screening, in pre-employment training, in the onboarding process, in the single and largest phase of them all, which is the sustainability of the employee so that folks can, can retain their jobs. So far, uh, I think that we have concentrated uh, a lot of our efforts in the sourcing, the screening, and the intake uh, part of the process. And many companies have launched programs that I would consider to be in, for lack of better words, in, in, in pilot phase. In other words, they have not been institutionalized within their organizations in every geography and in every type of job that exists. They are dedicated programs, which is a fabulous start in particular cities, in particular locations where they have the resources to implement the programs, but also and maybe in particular functions as well. Okay, This is where we have people coming in to do certain types of jobs within the organization. I believe that the next big milestone for this type of neurodiversity programs is for them to be available everywhere on every type of job you will be absolutely amazed at the amount of talent that we have that has come our way we thought that we would be hiring when we launched our own program in in 2013 people in software development software testing and data quality analysis but when you look at chemical engineers people with degrees in writing people with degrees in policy people with degrees in just about every possible field that you can imagine you would consider it completely unfair to say, well, you are on the autism spectrum, you will do software testing, okay? We go back maybe 100 years with that premise and saying, if you are from this gender or that gender, this is the way, the, the type of work that you do, or if you are from this ethnicity or that ethnicity, this is what you do. So we broke away from that mold, we open up the faucet, but now the secret really is to scale it. How do we scale it? For me, in order for this to hap happen, Brent, is going to be necessary to increment, improve the three-way relationships and partnerships that we have between enterprise, federal government, state government, of course, and also the NGO, the third sector. Okay, I think that together we can really create this scalable and sustainable systems. I'm going to take just 30 more seconds just to say one area where I believe that we need a significant amount of coordination and that is in the sustainability phase, okay? I think that it, uh, for, for me to, uh, to say we have arrived and we have programs that work, uh, I don't think that it would be a fair statement. I think that we are still in that phase where we've proven that the concept is something that is absolutely valuable for enterprises. The next big thing is how do we scale it? How do we make it pervasive? Not only within our companies, but beyond in other companies as well. Brent, I think you're muted as well. We're all going to get a chance to do that um, <laughs> uh, today. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, I want to I want to go to Scott um, because I know that ODEP um, spends a lot of time thinking about um, how we can leverage trends in the workforce, whether it's around remote work or around artificial intelligence, automation, assistive technologies, and so on. Um, uh, and also sort of looking at, uh, you know, four potential, um, barriers that may, may arise as well out of these, um, changes. So could you talk a little bit about, uh, how ODEP is thinking these days, um, about the emergence of these new technologies and systems and, uh, both the potential upsides as well as some of the challenges that might be, um, uh, developing. Yeah, great. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, thanks for um, asking about that. Um, um, I would say, Brett, first, I want to also spotlight um, just really briefly, it's uh, National Disability Employment Awareness Month, or NDEAM for short, in, all throughout October. And we have an event for that coming up on the 20th at 2 p.m. for Department of Labor. So um, if you check out uh, dealwell.gov slash agency slash ODEP, you can find uh, links to our NDEAM or NDEAM for short page. And then I also just wanted to mention briefly too, is that we have a research product that I'll, I can talk about later 
um, if it comes up in Q&A on supporting employment for young adults in the autism spectrum. But shifting back just briefly to emerging tech and remote-based work and teleworking and how that works for neurodivergent workers, uh, we have a technical assistance center at the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP, called uh, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, um, or PEAT, PEATWorks.org. And it provides resources on accessible uh, um, teleworking, e-recruiting, benchmarking technology in the future of work, artificial intelligence, virtual augmented reality, how all that is going to affect uh, the workplace now in the future and how the impact of COVID-19, for instance. And I think it's very applicable to neurodivergent folks as the workplace is changing to make sure there's full accessibility for software folks might need, assistive technology, accessible technology, um, and best practices for supporting eco access for remote-based work as you would in person or even for hybrid environments where you're spending some time in person, some time remotely, and some combination kind of of the two um, is really important. And I think that gets left out of the picture at times is that the adjustments that may need to be made for remote-based work might be a little bit different than they are for in person when you're talking about, you know, online platforms connecting on there diversity of software you may need at home. Um, on the other hand, when you're at home, you may have more control over your own systems and supports. For instance, your sensor environment, for instance, you might not have to adjust the lighting as much or the noise levels, et cetera, because it's your own house or whatever, or your own apartment. And so there might be greater flexibility for a lot of folks and that provides a lot of benefit for, for teleworking. Um, did you want me to, to go into to automation now too, or did, was I only talking about the remote-based work in this question? Sorry. Uh, let's see if we've got time. I want to make sure that Alex has a chance to weigh in here. Okay. Um, and I'd really be curious, Alex, whether um, you've seen anything in the last 18 months uh, as we've been moving through the pandemic uh, that either because of labor market demand or because of the more flexible working arrangements, uh, has anything gotten easier um, for neurodivergent workers um, during the pandemic or is it pretty much status quo from where we were before? One of the, that's a great question. One of the big things that I've noticed is that with the increase of remote work opportunities and work options has actually made it more accessible for people who are neurodivergent only because a lot of companies are realizing they don't need to necessarily have everyone in the office show up at this time in order for get work done. Companies are actually saving money by hiring people remotely versus bringing them into an office. And for a lot of people with um, who are neurodivergent who maybe struggle with certain executive functioning skills like showing up on time, looking professional, um, all these little soft skills that people do without even thinking most of the time, but are an extreme challenge to people who are neurodivergent, they now have the opportunity to instead um, show the less superficial aspects of their talents, meaning their ability to work, to get the job done. And in, in that way, it's been a blessing. Um, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, I was, I thought we didn't reverse. We didn't rehearse this question ahead of time, and I and I was hoping that I wasn't going to hear. No, it hasn't made a bit of difference, uh, and uh, it hasn't really opened up any new opportunities. So I'm glad to hear that this is, in fact, um, uh, you know, uh, the the case that um, more remote work means more opportunities for. Uh, uh, neuro, neurodivergent workers. Um, I I know that for uh, for me, it's been the introverts, uh, the golden age of the introvert um, over the last 18 months where we can sort of focus a lot on our work and think a lot, write a lot. Um, and so it's been really great in, in that in that way of being a much friendlier environment for people who don't necessarily uh, uh, enjoy the intensity of the social exchange in the office. So it's good to hear. Um, okay, Jessica, any any further thoughts on this? Um, 
what do you think the you know sort of the uh the companies that you work with um you know the building an, a neurodiversity hiring program what's kind of the biggest challenge that they face uh, a company faces yeah um oh, there are a lot of challenges um and i think jose could speak to this well too if we had more time um i would say that you know with any type of cultural shift and change in a company it takes time um and i my background comes from organizational change management and fundamentally we know that organizations don't change the people within organizations change um, and i think that you know the challenges we find in working with organizations is one you know finding the right leaders within the organization to champion and move the work forward um, as we've talked a lot about here today to really be equitable and inclusive for neurodiversity we have to be changing the way that we do work um, you know, we've shown many examples here, but, you know, and what Jose was alluding to of the sustainment piece, what are actual workplace practices that we change? You know, some, um, when we run these hiring programs, we work with very specific departments and very specific managers where we may change the way in which training is done, where, you know, typically when you're training a new employee, and even in the virtual world, we are relying a lot on um, what I'll call like auditory processing. So as the new hire, I'm listening to a trainer talk about how to do my work. And um, auditory processing for some can be more delayed. So in a more universal way, I've been teaching a lot of our managers we work with, when you're assigning a task or you're training, you know, normally we'll say, OK, John, tomorrow, send an email to this person, do research on these topics. And I'm relying on how well I am at listening to what the task is that needs to get done. Well, now that we're in a virtual world, we're saying, OK, use the chat function. Say one, email John but tomorrow to the research on this by next week. Having that um, information pr presented in multiple formats helps with information processing. And that's helpful for all of us. Like if you've ever watched a TV show and you turn on closed captioning because you're like, well, I can't understand this. <laughs> like that's helpful for me, right? And that's the that's like the fundamental challenge behind a sustainable practice where how do you get all of your managers to realize that we all learn better in these ways and creating that psychological safety for our employees. I think also, Jose, I always remember talking to you early on, even when we were starting four years ago, that you said, you know, our hiring managers have shared with us what a better manager they've become for all of their people because we are managing to the individual needs. Who would have thought that that's, you know, what we need? And most importantly, that I can step back as a leader and not look at a situation only from my lens, that I'm willing to actually lead with curiosity and ask my employee, you know, when you approach this problem, how did you approach it? And listening to what they're saying before I judge whether it was right or wrong and making these vast assumptions that, you know, the person wasn't, I don't know, smart enough or, you know, it, a lot of it is that it's bringing this human aspect back to how you manage and lead and presenting information, making adjustments to policies and procedures, not just in words, but how do we put charts? How do we use process flows? How can we visualize information in a better way? Um, and so many you know, other things, but I think that's fundamentally the challenge is finding managers who want to pilot this. You're taking a big leap of faith and you are taking on extra work to lead a program like this. And then how do you institutionalize this across the organization? How do you get HR on board? How do you get business leaders at the department levels on board? And really that's the, Jose, you call it the next frontier. Um, and that's exactly what I think it is. Uh, um, so I think I mentioned this maybe on one of our um, pre-calls, but I, my, uh, my youngest uh, who just turned 20 has autism 
and uh, he um, he has t he teaches people all the time, not explicitly but implicitly about how to relate to someone who has uh, this divergent quality in the way that they perceive the world, uh, and he he now really sees it as. Um, you know, I see the world differently and that's valuable. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, as much as we focus on building up the skills of workers uh, to make them better fits for their environment, that there is this place where, especially the neurodivergent can help the um, improve the skill base of the workplace, you know, like how, how to relate to how to um, partner with people who are not going to maybe read all of the um, the nonverbal cues as closely as uh, somebody who isn't a neurodivergent. I would also say, though, that I, I, I think I when when you are working with somebody and you had a family member or you start and you work with them long enough, you start to see those characteristics uh, in the quote unquote typical population as well. It isn't just these workers who are uh, these neurodivergent workers who are identified as such that are struggling. It's, it's workers who don't have that diagnosis, who don't have that label on them they, uh, this goes back to the universal design idea, they will benefit from a workplace. Uh, it will make a work, the workplace easier for a lot more people than just those people who wear the label. So, okay, uh, let's talk about public policy for a few minutes before we go to Q&A with the audience. Um, uh, Scott, uh, I want to start with you here, since you are the public policy maven on this panel, somebody who is up to their neck every day in um, the way that the federal government and state governments are organizing themselves to respond to the laws um, around this. Um, uh, so federal contractors are prohibited under Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act are prohibited from discriminating against persons with disabilities. Um, there's also a, an employment target um, for federal offices, uh, employment in federal offices, um, and a target for contractors. Um, how, uh, how are these efforts going? What do you see uh, in terms of the ability of employers, both public and private, to sort of reach the goals that that have been set out for them. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, um, Brent. Um, and um, and sorry if I said Brent before or earlier. I've had a little anxiety today, so I apologize if I misconstrued your your name when it came out. Sometimes my audio doesn't come right no, out when no, it comes out of my right brain. Ahead. I'll um, answer to anything. Um, the and by the way, I'm using captioning right now actually for Chrome, and that helps me a lot with the auditory processing because I don't always process everything that well auditory wise. So seeing it in written form is is very helpful. Um, so I should clarify for the audience that the, so the Rehab Act has affirmative action requirements for hiring for federal contractors, Section 503, and federal agencies, Section 501. And ODEP is a non regulatory agency, non enforcement. But we help advance these priorities for both sections of the law and other laws and policies, enhance policies and practices to make uh, um, to increase, make it happen to increase access to gainful employment, competitive integrated employment for people with disabilities. And our our sister agency at DOL, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, or OFCCP, oversees Rehab Act Section 503, which requires agencies or requires um, federal contractors to take proactive steps to recruit, hire, retain, and advance workers with disabilities of all types cognitive, neurological, sensory, physical, mental health. And I think that's going quite well is that you're seeing a lot of employers that are taking really strong steps and, and starting firm action hiring programs. Neurodiversity at work programs are very common among federal contractors, contractors in the United States to reach and move toward a utilization goal of 7% of the workforces as the proportion of workers with disabilities. Uh, which is, um, I think it's an ambitious goal um, in the sense that I know historically folks have been so underrepresented 
that they're, believe it or not, are much lower percentage than even that at times with folks with disabilities identifying um, among employers, even though about 20% of Americans have disabilities. And I would say that these, the hiring programs, especially on neurodiversity at work, are helping achieve that goal of the 7%. Um, although there are a lot of myths out there that a lot of folks think, oh, I can't start these programs because they think it'll be discrimination. They get into legal discussions with folks, not realizing there are affirmative action exceptions to the Rehab Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act that, that not only permit these programs, but encourage them because they help uh, support gainful employment access for people with disabilities. And so we want to see more of these programs and, and celebrate firm action um, ways of supporting access to employment for people with disabilities. We just have to always recognize that disclosure of disability should always be voluntary and you should also be able to come in the standard way if you want to as well. You don't have to come in a hiring program. It's just an extra option for you to enter in employment. And then in parallel, we're trying to model in the federal government as well achievement toward hiring goals with Section 501, which is very similar to what federal contractors have to do. It has a target hiring goal of 12% in the federal government for the proportion of workers with disabilities. And many, many agencies are already exceeding um, that goal. Um, and in concert, there's a secondary goal too for, for 2%. I say secondary, it's really a parallel goal for 2% for recruiting, hiring, retaining, and advancing workers with targeted or significant disabilities. So autism, intellectual disability, blindness, deafness, and mental health disabilities, for instance. And when you see the significant disabilities, that's where agencies are not always, you know, have some room to grow, if you will, to advance and support a better access to gainful employment in the federal government, uh, for instance, on autism, other neurological disabilities. And you see that especially with the upper grade levels. So I'm a GS-14 senior policy advisor at ODEP. And I would say for grade levels 12 to 14, the senior executive service and the executive service uh, significant disabilities or targeted disabilities remain highly underrepresented. So agencies are, are especially trying to make strides to enhance access to gainful employment in those upper grade levels, including for the use of the Schedule A hiring authority for people with disabilities, which is affirmative action hiring authority we have here in the federal government. And then a lot of uh, federal contractors are doing similar with their, as I say, with their affirmative action hiring programs. So I'm, I'm very hopeful and optimistic of what I, I see out there with these policies. And they're designed in a way in the Rehab Act to encourage better access to gainful employment because of the historical representation representation of people with disabilities from diverse backgrounds. Um, and I, I think they're helping achieve that goal, but we still have some ways to go to, to go on that pathway to supporting full access to employment for neurodivergent workers and other people with disabilities in the workplace in the private sector and here in the federal government and state and local government. That's terrific. So Alex, um... I wanted to ask you about uh, neurodiversity, cultural diversity, um, and um, this this idea that we call intersectionality. Um, can you explain this um, to the audience? Are there efforts around um, that are seeking to build uh, a more inclusive workplace? Uh, using these ideas and uh, how's it how's it going? Sure thing. So regarding cultural diversity and intersectionality, it's this understanding that when we meet someone with um, a disability, they're not just someone with a disability. They are someone with a unique political, religious, and cultural background on top of their disability. And when we incorporate a universal design, we're not just accommodating the disability, we're accommodating all aspects of the person. And ways that this may look like. So in terms of cultural diversity, I know just living in Los Angeles, um, a lot of people on the spectrum who are devout Orthodox um, Jews and for getting someone to work on Friday after 3 p.m., um, right before um, the weekly religious holiday Shabbat is not possible to do because that's the time that they're prepping to do that. Um, but usually though, when companies are hiring, they might, they might say something like, oh, you have to be available Monday through th Friday, nine to five, or else it's a no go. An example of um, 
a workplace that would accommodate cultural diversity is accept alternative hours to substitute for the time that they would actually spend prepping in addition to accommodating any aspect of their disability or any other traditions that are integral in terms of their life. Right, so kind of uh, getting to the layers of the person, um, you know, that there, there may be in addition to whatever is associated with their neurodivergent characteristic, uh, other aspects of their lives that also need attention. And again, that's not just for the neurodivergent, that's for everybody in the workplace, um, you know, and really uh, promoting, uh, you know, a welcoming and uh, I think the term that was used er earlier, psychologically safe uh, mm -hmm. environment um, is something that, um, that we can all benefit from in one way or, or another. Um, Jessica, do you have any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, so um, oh, a lot of things come to mind and I wanted to bring this up earlier too, where um, tying together, you know, the intersectionality, I do think companies are starting to really address and um, talk about that. I've seen a lot of training by other peers that have activities that, you know, look at who we are as whole people. Um, and so I think that that work is happening. Um, what I wanted to add here, I do think I have definitely something to say about the role of government at more of the local level. Um, but, you know, to what Alex was just talking about in disclosure, I think, you know, what we coach our candidates on is really advocating for how you do your best work. Um, and I think that's true for all of us that we need to right. be able to, and in a virtual world, I think that's become ever more necessary as a conversation between an employee and their manager. Um, but that is really one of the key pieces here of, you know, we talked about accommodations earlier, um, where in the physical disability space, where those are a little more uh, straightforward, whereas for neurodivergent employees, um, it's asking for, you know, other types of accommodations that may not be a big cost to the company, but just how we communicate with one another. Um, and one of the examples that really came, has come to mind during the pandemic is, you know, our team is looking at how are we learning empathy through the pandemic? And when I talk to community members about this time, you know, I think we all can relate now to how when we're in a social situation, we're trying to figure out like, okay, do I give this person a hug? Do I keep my mask on? You know, how do I navigate the social right. etiquette of living today and meeting people today? And a lot of people in our community have shared with us, like Jessica, welcome to my world. Yeah. This is my daily life of what is socially acceptable in this situation. I'm trying to figure out and navigate how I approach the situation where now I know I appreciate when I walk into a room or a meeting, it's laid out clearly, you know, keep your mask on when you're in these situations. If everyone's comfortable, we do this, right? And it's just, we're laying out specifically mm -hmm how to engage the rules of engagement mm -hmm. um and i think that's just i want i've been wanting to add that as an example yeah. for all of us to really reflect and think about how much it's helped us when we put these concrete directions of how to engage and that's true for any aspect yeah. of work I, um, I think this is such an important point um the way that the pandemic is renorming american society in so many different areas uh, Shaking hands is one of the, yes. you know, the principal examples at the beginning of the pandemic. It was like everybody suddenly, you know, they just sort of lost their physical coordination of meeting new people. Um, and we're kind of, uh, we're, we're still kind of feeling our way forward on these things. Um, and so yeah. that's, it's an important observation. It's also a reminder to the neurotypical world that this is exactly what it means to be neurodivergent is not to know to enter into a social setting and not know sometimes exactly what the protocols are or being able to read the expectations of the other person um, uh, 
so it's a, a it's a really really helpful point um jose um where do you think private and governmental organizations can play a role in job preparation and matching uh, especially in skills development um, and linking, uh, helping to link neurodivergent people with employers. Uh, first, uh, I just want to add one more thought yeah. to one of the, the previous comments. I think that one of the opportunities that also has pre been presented due to the pandemic, not, of course, there's some terrible things that have happened. There's been a significant amount of the loss of life and people that are impacted. Or on the other hand, I also feel that uh, this type of uh, environment, as uh, Jessica was saying and Scott before, opened up some opportunities. Alex was also mentioning, open up some opportunities for people that feel more comfortable to work from a remote location. I think that is this is uh, incredibly valuable for uh, folks on the autism spectrum that live in rural locations throughout mm -hmm. the United States. Yeah. Uh, we, we think in terms of the services that are available in one particular location, but there's a, there's a significant number of people that are on the autism spectrum that are in, in, in rural locations that could benefit also from this new way of, of doing things. Um, back, back to your, your question, ways in which uh, uh, private sector NGOs and government uh, can collaborate. I, I, I think that we are already doing some some good work i think that it needs to be obviously refined and and improved but uh, for the listeners who are or the, the audience that we have today who are not familiar with this every state has a, an office of vocational rehabilitation okay and basically their mission is to provide uh, opportunities for individuals who are um, in this case on the autism spectrum supporting them through the job search and organizations like Jessica's, I'm sure that you work with the vocational rehabilitation departments. And that is a way in which the NGOs who have a, a mission to support individuals get the necessary support from government in order to for these things to be supported, these programs to be supported. But Scott, there's you and I have had these conversations before where this type of support, and we're going back to the conversation of the sustainability of the employees. The current models that we have provide support for people for 90 days. Okay. I don't know if something has changed or not, but I believe that's still the, the standard. Life happens in the enterprise after 90 days. There's reorganization, there's change. That great manager who hired me as an autistic person maybe is moving on to a new location and I may need supports in, in those transitions as well. I believe that there's an, a great opportunity here if we look. I mean, this is the way that I rationalize it. I'm not an expert in government by any stretch of the imagination, but but I, I feel that 99% of the people that we hire were people that were unemployed or underemployed. They are become they have become taxpayers. Okay, so on the one side, we are uh, they are stopped they stop receiving uh, supports from the government. Okay, and now they are becoming taxpayers. The next the, the net effect of that is a certain amount of money that I believe uh, could be somehow utilized to create a portable support system for the individuals. Because as we know, no, as much as I would like to retain everybody for the rest of their careers at SAP, people have the interest in, in moving on and getting a new job and a new opportunity, right? What, what if there was a mechanism by which we could create, create the portability of the job coaching supports that people need in order to continue to become taxpayers and become self-standing and self-supporting. I think that there's an ample, ample opportunity for us still to refine those systems. And I'm sure that there's a willingness from the private sector, the NGOs and, and the government to do that. It's just a matter of putting put, pen to paper and, and getting right. it done. Right. Yes. Okay, well, we have uh, some questions to deal with. And as I said, I uh, we're going to move on now to the Q&A. Um, uh, and we've got a few submitted online. Uh, but as I said, I want first, I want the first uh, bite of this apple. Um, and I put that question into the chat function so you guys can see it. But um, Scott and Alex, uh, can you each talk a little bit about your personal experiences. What are the common misperceptions 
that you've faced uh, as you've developed your own careers uh, and your own uh, opportunities in life? Uh, and what kinds of things have helped you succeed in the workplace and helped you to uh, shift sort of people's, uh, your, your neurotypical colleagues thinking about, um, about uh, inclusion of individuals with um, uh, neurodivergent characteristics? And uh, I'll let Alex go first, and then we'll go to you, Scott. Um, one of the biggest, um, in terms of workplace, in terms of discrimination that I've dealt with, is a lot of misinterpretation of my nonverbal communication and my verbal behavior. Um, one of the ways that this manifests is uh, sort of passive aggressive reactions are not being called back, that sort of thing. A lot of um, sort of non-spoken social um, aspects. And one of the ways that I've overcome this is through utilizing radical honesty in my communication. So instead of focusing on does something sound the most polite and perfect, being like what is actually going through my mind in a non-emotional context, in a very, and just tell them directly. And some of the most common feedback that I get is that a lot of people are thinking the same things I am, but nobody <laughs> says it until I do. So it's actually been quite a positive experience. Um, I have a lot of underestimating of my skills before people get to know me. That's fairly common. And I'm not one to go and brag and be like, well, I can do this and this and this, because to me, it's more... You know, if that person is willing to see me for what I can contribute, then that shows me more about their character than it does about mine. And I'll, another way that I've overcome this is I start my own business opportunities because I'm tired of waiting for the approval of other people. I um, take a lot of initiative in creating my own work experiences in order to... Um, kind of further my career and not feel stuck by all my diagnoses. That's excellent. Scott, what about you? Yeah, I would say similar. I mean, a lot of that really resonates, uh, Alex, what you just shared uh, with me as well, in terms of I've also experienced a lot of underestimation of my abilities, a lot of assumptions folks have made based on my eight a typical way of thinking and learning and information processing and the quirks I have. And because folks can't actually see my brain itself, people make assumptions about what I'm doing and they don't have flexible thinking. There's not always a lot of open-mindedness at times in my experiences in education and in the workplace, historically in my in my life. I, I would say also as a passing thing, by the way, is, is I, I think judging folks based on eye contact or their handshakes or things like that, that should be something that post pandemic, we should like make strides to move away from that kind of a thing. I've uh, been glad that we're not, and it's not just, not just autistic people, other folks with disabilities, for instance, have faced great barriers there, folks with spinal cord injury, for instance, and other motor uh, disabilities that affect motor coordination may not be able to make a lot of those, those movements or interact in the same way. Folks with visual disabilities, for instance, blind low vision may not make eye contact. About. So like, there's a lot of similarity across disabilities and I've also have had a uh, lack of access to like direct communication and feedback and positive supports. I found in the last several years, as I've gotten more positive supports, believe it or not, I've done a lot better in my yeah. job. Yeah. It's motivated me and encouraged me. And then I've also gotten assistance from, for instance, the Job Accommodation Network, just to shout out, that's an ODEP resource that's free, confidential expert assistance, askjan.org, please use it. Uh, job seekers, employers, uh, workers with disabilities, friends, parents, everyone can can use it. The resources online and for specialists, they have it at Jan. And in my case, I got access to coaching. It wasn't job coaching though, like from vocational rehab. Um, we termed it, I guess, more sort of like executive coaching because I didn't even know how to do my job. I just needed nuances about workplace communication, executive functioning, different strategies that could sort of enhance me, uh, enhance how I do my job and my performance and productivity. So when I had that, 
access to that coach a, a several years ago when I was newer in my work at the Office of Disability Employment Policy as a policy advisor, and now I'm a senior policy advisor. We would have these phone calls every week or every couple of weeks, and we just discuss like how's it going and what are some strategies or rules of the road that may help mm -hmm. make things smoother. Mm -hmm. That can help me interact better, help me perform better, interactive and collaborate with my colleagues in it, and it helped over time. And then, you know, some of it is just getting better situated in the in the workplace was helpful for that too. And then making use of technology as well. Um, I used before the pandemic, and I'm sure post pandemic, since we've been remotely working in the government, federal government, since March of 2020. We've not been back in person yet. I know some folks that transitioned to the in person workplace. Uh, headphones that are noise canceling, fidget aids um, that I can sort of fidget with in, in my hands, uh, just other types of assistive technology to help with executive functioning. And then again, just the, the strong support from my managers when they've been more open-minded, flexible in their thinking. I can't tell you how much that's is priceless. It doesn't cost any money. A lot of these things we're talking about have, have no money aspect. Uh, they're, the average accommodation or average support has no numerical monetary value and even the ones that have a cost are just about five hundred dollars according to the job accommodation network and so it's just a change in mindset is a lot of what we're talking about today to folks to help folks empower people like myself where my performance and productivity went sky high as i got just some extra adjustments and supports that again would benefit a lot of other folks um and that includes, for instance, the captioning benefits other folks in meetings, because now we can have transcripts of meetings at times when you save the captioning file. So uh, I, I think just to think differently on these approaches we're talking about on neurodivergence um, in terms of neuro neurodivergent workers and neurodiversity at work is a large part in terms of benefiting employers. And I, I, I hope that learning from the experiences that I have and challenges and challenges that Alex had can really help um, enhance folks out there who are you know, um, watching this webinar right now or future presentations and thinking about how they can make their own workplace um, ben have benefits for the talents and skills from um, neurodivergent workers and other folks with disabilities and enhance their, their workplace mission, um, whether it's at an agency or a private sector organization and benefit their, their business bottom line. That's terrific. Okay, uh, we've got uh, the next question. I'm going to put it in this one. I really will put in the chat. Um, uh, someone is asking um, whether a nonverbal learning disability is considered uh, a neurodiverse or neurodivergent person, um, and how can uh, neurodiverse individuals go about finding and searching for employers that emphasize inclusivity? Um, uh, I, I think what we've got here is somebody who's ha not had great success with like USA Jobs or, you know, some other platforms. So um, so let's take the first part of that first. Uh, anybody feel like they're particularly well positioned to answer that first question about uh, NVLD? <laughs> okay, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, and then I'll throw it over to Al Alex. You want to answer it as well? Um, so sure thing. I would say that there is uh, there's a lot of overlap at times with with nonverbal learning disabilities and and autism and other aspects of neurodivergence. I actually have uh, nonverbal learning disabilities myself alongside my, my autism, and I think a lot of the practices in terms of that we're talking about today would be just as helpful uh, for folks with nonverbal learning disabilities and you know. ADHD and other aspects of where you're thinking about where the OCD, where the where the brain again may process information, learn and think um, differently. Um, and I also just briefly, and then I'll throw it over to Alex, is um, going about finding and searching for candidates, job candidates who um, and supporting inclusivity. Um, I, I think to make sure that things are explicit out there in terms of how you apply for the job, like don't make any assumptions, kind of on that. And, and make sure you support full cognitive accessibility for folks when you're thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, or DEIA, for, for um, hiring folks from diverse backgrounds, underrepresented uh, job seekers, including people with disabilities and neurodivergent folks among that group. Um, and I know for USAJobs.gov, there's a lot of information, for instance, there about hiring people with disabilities, recruiting hiring people with disabilities. And I hope that you can we can see that more and more in the private sector as well and in state and local government, too, is being explicit in the information and then partnering with 
uh, folks who are neurodivergent and other people with disabilities to make sure that there's input and full collaboration when you're um, looking for candidates and fi finding talented um, potential workers for your workplace um, is a large part of that job search. And then making sure also they, for instance, still have access to accommodations, even that job search process and applying the jobs. Um, and that's again, where, where the job accommodation network can come into play, sjan.org. Uh, Alex, uh, you'd like to answer it as well. So, um NL, well, I call it NLD, but I know people will call it different things. Um, I personally don't have it, but when I was in treatment as a child, I went to school with a lot of people with NLD and know a lot of people with it. And I consider it um, a neurodivergent um, condition. However, the reason why some may not is because it's not in the DSM-5 or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5th edition, which has all the list of all the disorders that people use, doctors use, and clinicians to get official diagnoses. Um, however, though, I do consider it personally um, as part of the neurodiverse spectrum. Um, in terms of some advice I have for the second part of the question about finding and searching for employers that emphasize inclusivity. One of the things I will say is that a lot of companies that call themselves inclusive may not even necessarily be inclusive. It's um, They may be striving to be, but they're not actually there yet. So what I would do is when you get in contact with this organization. Yes, they might be interviewing you, but you should interview them right back because certain things you ask and certain questions or certain things you learn about the company will determine whether they're actually going to truly accommodate you or not. Um, and I think it's important when you go about um, searching for jobs, taking initiative, reaching out to the companies, being like, hey, I think I could potentially be a really good fit. I saw that you're looking at this, this, and that. Um, can I ask you a few questions? Really, instead of waiting for someone to be inclusive for you, really go out and seek them and be proactive is, is a good piece of advice that I'd highly recommend in this instance. Perfect. I, I want to make sure if uh, either Jessica or Jose have anything they wanted to add to, to these questions, they've got a chance to to jump in, but we've got one more question. I'm hoping we can squeeze in before the uh, run out of time. I just have a quick uh, comment related to that. There's agencies, NGOs out there that are specialized in neurodiversity. Uh, my recommendation would be to seek those out. They have a really good understanding as to who, who are those employers, what are the standards, what are the channels, what programs they have. Uh, of course, Jessica is uh, leads one such organization. Uh, you are in the in the west coast in the east coast if you're on the east coast located there is another entity called neuro neurodiversity in the workplace they have been doing this for a year they have supported the journey of many companies in the east coast well throughout the united states but that would be my recommendation seek them out uh i think that they have contacts with a bunch of companies out there and they can um uh, refer you to uh opportunities in those employers yeah i think it'd be helpful if we put together that list uh, of the ones that we know about in addition to um, talent works uh, and and uh, the the group that you just mentioned here on the east coast so we will we will try to get that posted somehow to the internet um, uh, so uh, let's just take this last question real quickly um, which is, uh, for neurodivergent workers, it can be a hard decision about whether to self-identify on job applications. Um, can you talk about that? Uh, how do uh, neurodivergent workers think about that? And should employers consider rethinking those self-identifying parts of the application? Those are all really good questions. I, Jessica, why don't you why don't you take that one? Okay. Yeah, um, we know that this is disclosure is a very highly personal decision and can be very complex uh, to decide. I think what's important to break down initially is um, that, you know, so Scott knows this very well. If you are, if the, if the company you are applying to has a target they are trying to reach, 
you will be asked at several times in the application, I think one or two times in the application process before you take the job. And then while you're in your job, they have a self ID, you know, survey or campaign that will go out to the entire organization. When, if and when you check that checkbox to self identify, what's important to know is that your hiring manager does not see that data. And the people you work with directly do not see that data. Oftentimes, only a couple of people in human resources and analytics might see that data point that is reported to the government for those Section 503 goals. So the important thing to break down there is just because you identify on that survey does not mean that your hiring manager and those you work with and support you know that. And I think for a lot of people, that's not made transparent in organizations that how that survey data is used. So for employers, I would highly encourage that when you send a survey like that out, that it's very clear how the data is going to be used and reported. As you decide if you want to self-identify to your manager, I would consider really the conversation around you know, disclosing and what do you need to do your best work and how can your manager help you and to really frame the conversation that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we encourage disclosure when you feel comfortable and safe to do so, because it really opens a safe conversation with your manager in order for you to be successful in your job. And that's really important. Um, I so know we're over it, time, so I'll pause. Yeah, so is, is it typical then for, say, uh, a neurodivergent person lands a job. This hasn't been part of the, you know, the interviewing disclosure. Uh, it's, but uh, the person gets to the job. They're there for a couple months, uh, and they realize that they 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 need some sort of accommodation um, in order to be more productive, more successful in the job. Do people usually go first to HR to talk to the HR team about the issue to help navigate the conversation with the manager, or do you go to the manager first and then uh, bring HR in after that? I'd say it's either, but both. So whether whoever you disclose to first will usually bring in the other party um, to be involved in that conversation. If I may, may, may add just a quick comment here, uh, Brent. I think that there's three stops. The first one is as people are looking for a job and they apply for a position, uh, understanding uh, whether there is a program that provides pre-employment type of training program. Um, the second one would be once a program, let's say that you apply for a job and you're going to go through an interview process, you can you can disclose it. Hopefully there will be some accommodations to have a, an accommodated interview process. Mm -hmm. The third one is after you get the job, as you were mentioning, that you know two or three months down the road you say you know i really need to speak to somebody because i need some supports uh and, and then of course the levels of disclosure vary between you know do you want to just disclose to your manager do you want to disclose to your team mm -hmm. and there's techniques and and there should be accommodations that would allow somebody to do that scott yeah yeah to to add to that what you said uh jose um is from the employer perspective for self-identification our employer Re resource center earn askearn.org has great resources on self-identification of disability status and then from the job seeker perspective jan has resources on the on identification of disability status obviously it's a personal dynamic thing and it depends on the individual job seeker and their interaction with their employer in terms of what that looks like and obviously the employer cannot specifically ask about disability that it has to be voluntary self-identification um i also just wanted to mention just quickly in passing, since we're uh, running out of time, also that one of the resources that I forgot to mention, um, also from the uh, sustainability standpoint too, is employee resource groups or affinity groups. And that can also help when folks, this is relevant to self-identification too, is when folks are self-identifying, maybe they're newer to the disability world, um, interacting with other folks in their in affinity group for folks with disabilities can help with that process, whether they're new to the job or have been on the workplace for a while. and. I know that helps us at the Department of Labor. I happen to be one of my, outside of my regular job is I'm, I'm president of our affinity group for workers with disabilities at the Department of Labor right now, uh, newly elected in July. And I know that it's been helpful in terms of engagement uh, for the workplace and the diversity, inclusion, equity, accessibility kind of end and fits this, as, as I say, the self-identification kind of aspect for 
mm-hmm. neurodivergent workers and other workers with disabilities to find that comfort that there are a lot of other folks out there that can help support empowerment and access. And then you're not alone. I think folks need to know that when they're self-identifying. And obviously folks self-identify at different phases, sometimes in the job application process, sometimes when they start at work later on. I've known folks with disabilities, including autistic people, other neurodivergent folks who many different points in the process. It sort of depends on, again, the 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 company or agency they're working at and and their level of comfort with discussing their own disability can affect it as well. If you're new to autism, you just find out about your autism like eight months ago. And that's the case for a lot of adults who didn't grow up with a diagnosis because of a lot of barriers uh, historically with the autism community. And um, then it can be uncomfortable to di- to disclose versus it's very different process for self-identification and disclosure for say someone like me where i've been out about my autism publicly for a long long time many many years been active in in advocacy engagement for about 18 years now so it's a very different lived experience for folks who are newer to that and we need a perspective take on that have empathy on that disclosure process and i i hope that for disclosure self-identification that employers can emp- have empathy for that and empathy when folks are requesting accommodations as well in that identification process to 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 listen to folks actively and make that process as smooth as possible and then make adjustments as needed to reduce barriers to requesting combinations so folks can get the combinations they need to be successful. Combinations are about enhancing performance and productivity. Um, that's what it's about, making sure folks can be successful and in, in, inclusively supported in the workplace to enhance, again, that business bottom line or the agency mission. And we just have to keep promoting that message out there that once you have that support, it'll just benefit companies and agencies so much and empower them to be so successful. So I, I hope that helps a lot with the identification process. Yeah. Well, uh, that is a great note for us to wrap up on. Uh, just a reminder that uh, everybody either wins or loses together on this uh, as companies, as a society, as um, as a country, um, you know, the, to the extent that we're doing this uh, the right way, um, we are um, we are adding uh, just a ton of benefit um, both to the individual, the affected individual, but also uh, to the business and to um, the broader society. So I want to thank all of the panelists for a very generous time uh, in today and as we prepared for this. Um, you did a really outstanding job, all of you, and we we're so appreciative of the work that you, not just that you did today with us, but the work that you're doing every day in your work. So uh, again, a great appreciation, and we look forward to hearing more about each of you and your work in the, in the months to come. Thanks, Brent. Thanks so much. For hosting and everybody for hosting in this, and stay safe and well, everybody. Yes, thank you so much for being here with us.